Well, I hope you guys read up on leukocoria, a little bit on leukocoria, which means what? My pupil, from which language? The Greek, of course. That's processing, it's getting better. So actually the lecture on Wednesday at Grand Rounds was, was really good because he talked a lot about um, some of the things we're going to talk about today. So that turned out to be very fortuitous that Grand Rounds was talking about tumors in kids especially. So we're going back to the Grand Tetons, floating along the snake at the base of the Grand Tetons. And here we have a close up. So Taven like climbs those things. And so this is a little cave go and screws up to the top there to the ground. And here we are. This is as big a rapid as you get on this part of the snake. I mean, this is definitely calm. It's like sitting in your living room floating by a picture of the mountains. And believe it or not, this is Mount Moran. Named after the Moran Ice Center? No, not really. John Moran was a naturalist at the turn of the century. And so this is a uh, named after after Moran, not John Moran. And there you can see the grand poking up through the trees. All right, so we're looking at a patient like this. This is a child. Mom notices something funny in the pupil. Maybe it's taking a picture. Maybe it's looking at what the eye is doing. And then we dilate the kid's eye, and we see this picture right here. So this ch child had leukocoria. So what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the entities that we have to think about when we think about leukocoria. So Becca, ha, you thought you could hide back there. We're doing the order backwards today. You guys <laughs> on your toes. Differential diagnosis of leukocoria. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of leukocoria? Retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma. Tara. Be a cataract. Cataract, a general cataract. Fever. Fever, what does that stand for? Uh, I always use the abbreviation, so let me think of this. Um, okay, come on. Familial, I'll give you a hand. Uh, familial exudative fissure retinal. Alright, so on a list of 12 causes, that would be 13. <laughs> it's on there. But it's on the list. Very good. Julia. PHPV, what does that stand for? Persistent fetal vasculature. Yeah, now it's called persistent fetal vasculature. It used to be called PHPV. So if you see that, persistent primary hyperplastic vitreous for PHPV, or now it's persistent fetal vasculature, PFV. Coast. Coast disease. Reese. Uh, um, toxo. Toxoplasmosis. Right now, the prematurity. Amen. 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 Oh, okay, so that would be 28th on the list. <laughs> but still. It's a ballpark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now we're getting down there now. Anybody? So, uh, just a regular retinal detachment. Yeah, okay, this could be, this could be a retinal detachment. This usually don't look white. This could be a retinal detachment. The other one is very obscure one. Trust me, 13. Sister sarcosis toxocariasis. What did I say? What did I say? Toxo well, it could be a severe toxoplasma where there's just a whited out macular scar, but that's uncommon. I meant toxocariasis, sorry about that. You get those cat parasites and dog parasites, you get them mixed up. UVIs can do it too. UVIs chronically or anything like that. So we're looking at um, Person and say we, we looked at that. Um, boy, we've come around. All right, Becca, again. What are we seeing right here? Um, I'm not sure exactly what we are looking at here, but there's a large growth of some sort. It's fairly white, uh -huh. yellowish a little bit. I, I don't even know what this picture is of. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this the retina? This is a dilated retinal okay. exam. And unfortunately, this is in the posterior fold. It's kind of obscuring the uh, macula and the optic, the optic nerve. Let's pretend this was that patient. You know, they, they, this is in the days when we did enucleations. And you enucleated the eye, 
we've cut it in half sagittally, and we see this growth right here. And all this, that's not just reflex from the camera, that's all white, little white speckles all over the place. What would you be thinking about here? Looks like maybe calcium deposits. Okay. And which of these entities has calcium in it? So retinoblastoma, one of the things that we use to help us discern retinoblastoma from these other lesions is calcification. So if you put an ultrasound on here, now obviously kids, especially if they're young kids, they're not going to let you just put an ultrasound probe on. So you have to do this under anesthesia. But if you put an ultrasound probe on there, and you just do a B scan, this tumor mass will show up on the B scan, and then you slowly turn down the gain, and when sound waves hit calcium, they bounce off. And so you get all these high spikes on an A scan. On a B scan, you have these bright spots. And then as you turn down the gain, the whole eye disappears, but the calcium still stays there. And so calcification is one way to help differentiate some of these lesions. And when you have a retinoblastoma, one of the characteristics of it is it tends to be calcified. And you can see right here on this gross picture, these white flecks on here are all calcification that's on that tumor. So when we look at a retinoblastoma, first thing we do is we describe grossly what the growth pattern is. And Tara, what are the growth patterns that we have of retinoblastomas? Grossly. Um, I'm not entirely sure. There are two of them, the way they can grow. One of them, they can grow in toward the vitreous, others they grow out underneath the retina. Endophytic and exophytic. And exophytic. So those are the two ways they grow. So sometimes they grow off the retina <coughs> into the eye, into the vitreous. That's endophytic, inside. Or they can grow underneath the retina and even cause this exudative retinal detachment. So this is called exophytic. So they can grow under the retina or in front of the retina. Exophytic, endophytic. Now here you can see one grossly right here, and here's an eye that's been removed, and this one is growing kind of inside of the retina, so this is now what we call endophytic. But when you look at these already, even at low power, you're starting to see these little areas of this magenta staining, and this is the areas of calcification. All right, so when we look at that, uh, Chris, what are we seeing here that, that kind of characterizes the growth pattern of these lesions? Uh, so we've got the areas of calcification and that necrosis kind of separating these uh, areas of dividing cells that are kind of purplish. So what happens is, is these tumor cells grow very fast. You know, in, in the third world, unfortunately, they have a lot of trouble recognizing these. And Bob was talking about some of the cases he's seeing, unfortunately, in, in Indonesia, where the, the kids just aren't coming in early and these can grow explosively. And when you look at these at low power, you'll see in the center of each of these clusters of cells a blood vessel. So what happens is, is these cells start growing and they literally outgrow their blood supply. And when they grow far enough away from the blood vessel, they die. And these areas here are necrotic. And then you get secondary calcification in the necrotic areas that we call dystrophic calcification. That's where the cells outgrow their blood supply, they die, they become secondary to calcify. Here you see again, viable tumor cells around the blood vessel in the center, and then they outgrow their blood supply, they die, and then you get the secondary dystrophic calcification. That's a real tip-off because these other lesions that do this don't form those calcified areas like this. All right, what's the, um, Julia, what's the classic finding we see at a higher microscopic level that discerns these retinoblastomas? All right, so these are called Flexner Wintersteiner rosettes, and these are the guys who described it. Believe it or not, there's even a little mitotic figure there, so that just shows you don't know, usually see mitotic figures in the retina. For some reason, when retina becomes dysplastic, either from, from benign overgrowth or from a tumor, it tends to form circles. And so you get these Flexner Wintersteiner rosettes. What's interesting is, in the center of these, they will often try to form a little bit of an outer limiting membrane. And so you'll often see a little line there. And then there'll even be crude attempts at making um, early rods in the center there. 
And so these look similar to what you see in another CNS tumor in kids, a neuroblastoma. They get, of course, everybody puts their name on something. There's Homer Wright rosettes in there that look very similar to these, but they don't have that attempt at an external limiting memory. And so these are the classic Flexner Wintersteiner rosettes. And boy, extra bonus points for this one, Ashley. What kind of stain is this, and why would I be showing you this with these rosettes? Okay, so right here, I mean, no, this, is, this was a tricky one. I don't think I'll put this on boards, but here's the rosette, and right here there's this little blue in here. This is an ocean blue stain. Now, remember our corneal lecture? What is our corneal dystrophy? Is what is ocean blue stain for? Mucopolysaccharides. So you get even little mucopolysaccharides in there. Remember, underneath the normal retina where the rod and cone segments are, there's little mucopolysaccharides in between there. And so when they're trying to make these flexible Wintersteiner rosettes, they actually make people probably separate them. So you don't get counted off for that, because that was a bonus question. Now, here's your real question. This kind of looks like a rosette, but it's a little bit different than a rosette. It's almost like it's a you know, broad horseshoe instead of a rosette. And if you look at it, there's the external limiting membrane, though, which isn't really a membrane. It's the little junctions. And it's attempting to make rods here. What do we call that? A fluoret. And a fluoret is a sign of differentiation. And so a really well differentiated retinoblastoma will have fluorets, and this is a good sign. <coughs> so this tells you that these, these, these are almost forming retinas, almost like someone takes a rosette and tries to unzip it and lay it out. So this is a sign of, of actual differentiation. So this is a good thing to see. So what we're trying to show here, Reese, what kind of structure is this right here and this right here? Is there blood vessels? Blood vessels. Why is it dark around there? Is that calcium? It's actually not calcium. Believe it or not, it's, it's DNA. I mean, I mean, you can't stand for DNA, but as these necrotic cells break down, they lose a lot of their nuclear contents, and the nuclear contents come out to the veins and deposit in the walls. And so you see that not uncommonly in these rapidly growing tumors. Here you see a close-up. This is all that nuclear material that's been, uh, you know, that's been released from these dying cells and it gathers around the veins. And there's a close-up. It does get some calcium also. But there's definitely some calcium here. So you, get, you do get half credit. Eileen, what are we looking at right here? Iris, here's the last. What are these things? Uh, that's the ciliary body. Yeah, ciliary processes kind of seen, not a Greek word, a French word, on foss. So a flat crack. Or as they'd say out there in West Valley, anfacy. So this is an anfacy view. <laughs> and so this is a view almost like a flat crack. When we're looking, here's the ciliary processes. Here's the lens. Iris tumor. What's going on here? Well, not quite invaded the ciliary body, but it's located around ciliary processes. So what do we call this? What stuff is usually in the hollow space there behind the lens? Vitreous. <laughs> vitreous. These are vitreous seeds. And so these are a bad prognosis. This is not a good prognosis because you can get bits of the tumor break off from the main tumor itself and they seed the vitreous. So this is the anterior vitreous. Remember there's vitreous even between the ciliary processes. And so these are seeds of tumor in the anterior vitreous. The reason why that's important, these are tough to treat. Systemic chemo sometimes doesn't get in there and even intraarterial chemo has trouble getting there. These are ones where you may even have to do intravitreal chemo injections to get these vitreous seeds. Other Chris, what are we looking at here? This is the angle. So the cornea is inferior photograph. So what's wrong with this picture? Oriented incorrectly. Exactly. See, I put one in every once in a while, see if you're paying attention. So this is upside down. <laughs> and you see here's iris, here's cornea. What's going on here? It looks like uh, in the 
necrotic tissue at an angle, it's causing them to drop in the meshwork. Not even necrotic, some of those cells are still alive. See, did you see the spread of the angle? Exactly. You can actually get tumor <coughs> seeds from retinal <coughs> spreading of the angle. And in fact, there in, in advanced cases, you can even get almost like a hypopion. It looks like layering out of white blood cells in the anterior chamber and its tumor cells. So again, not a good sign. You don't want these tumor cells here in the trabecular mesh where they can gain access outside the eye and spread. And so this is anterior seeding of the trabecular mesh work in the anterior chamber angle. Now, when retinoblastomas spread from the eye, Jason, how do they spread? Most commonly through the optic nerve. Through the optic nerve. And so you see in this particular one, here is the tumor here. And look at the tumor beyond the lamina fibrosa in the optic nerve head. Now, this is an old slide that, that I copied from the AFIP collection. This is probably, you know, 40 or uh, maybe 50 years old, 40 to 50 years old. And these, per these are the percentages. And this was when the treatment of retinoblastoma was you recognized it, you enucleated it. If it was small, you may try to laser it or maybe do cryo, but that's the only treatments they had. And so this is the percent who would um, metastasize. And this was back, you know, say 40 years ago. So if the tumor were just inside the eye, you had about an 8% chance. If it was the lamina fibrosa 15, in the optic nerve, almost half. And then if you have tumor at the cut surface, posterior surface of that optic nerve, it was 65% would metastasize, and these kids would die. And so those numbers aren't viable anymore because we now have new treatments that have come up in the last 40 years. But it's important that you remember that concept. So when the tumor is strictly in the eye, chance of that metastasizing is less than when it's at the fibrosa in the nerve. But the worst prognosis is if it's in the back posterior cut surface of the nerve. And so when they do enucleate these kids with retinoblastoma, they take as long a piece of nerve as they can and really go back far. First thing we do when we get one of these specimens is we take the distal end of the nerve and we actually cut it off and look at it separately just to make sure because prognostically it's very important whether there's still tumor left behind in that optic nerve or not. And this is what can happen if you don't. This is a kid from Nigeria. And so if you don't get the kids in right away, they can have explosive growth of these tumors. These are very, very rapidly growing tumor. Okay, Lee, we're looking inside an eye here, and we're seeing this kind of picture. And the, you know, some of the people tell me what you're seeing here. Well, you're seeing what looks like uh, retinal uh, tissue elevated uh, up close into the anterior vitreous. You also see dilated vessels or irregular vessels. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of like the coats that look. Exactly. So if you look, this is this is actually almost like a choroidal detachment. You know, you've seen choroidals, kissing choroidals, they call this. This is a, a child, so this child will say he's eight or ten. And what you see is you'll see that it's almost like there's a massive exudate underneath the retina pushing it forward. But if you see all these corkscrew vessels and these dilated telangiectetic vessels, this is classic for Coates disease. And this is true color. This has got a yellowish color to it, not a whitish color. It's kind of yellowish from that exudative detachment. And here you can see a little different look. Here is the retina is bulging forward. It's out of focus because there's all this exudate underneath it. Look at these telangiectetic vessels that are here. So Coates disease, unilateral or bilateral? Unilateral. Unilateral. Age compared to retinoblastomas? Um, like eight or something. Yeah, so older. You know, retinoblastoma, the most common age, if you look at most studies, is roughly two or less, two years old or less. These kids are eight, ten years old when this shows up. Male or female more? Males. Male, for some reason. Not sure why that is either. And so unilateral males a little bit older than retinoblastoma. And when we look, this is cut in half sagittally, and this is a globe growth thing. If you look, this is all exudate. And so when, you know, Jason looks at one of these in the lab, exudate is the consistency of jello. And so you hit that with a forcep, it's like gelatin. Because it's protein rich, it's lipid rich, it's like almost like super serum, if you will. And what are we showing here? Um, looks like lipid. 
deposits. Well, these are the these are those telangiectatic vessels. Uh -huh. There's a lot of lipid in here. And then when we look at the exudate, what causes these banana-shaped clefts in the exudate? Calcium or third, not calcium, but cholesterol. Cholesterol, exactly. So remember when we talked about if you want to look at a tumor that's got fat in it, you have to do it fresh. Because when you process this, you put it through cycles of dehydration and other things, what happens is that the lipid gets leached out, so it just leaves an empty space where it was. And cholesterol leaves like a banana shape. So you've got these banana shaped clefts. These are consistent with cholesterol. What kind of cells are all these right here? Is that uh, macrophages? Macrophages. And so they're attempting to kind of come here and eat up this extra. So these are all macrophages. And again, if you want to sound intelligent, you say, Macrophages, you know, if you put a fake British accent on it, you're intelligent. Macrophages. Sorry, Reese, but but for some reason, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm culturally biased, but when you put a southern accent on it, it like takes 20 IQ points off of your perception of the speaker. Whereas if you put a British accent on it, you say, oh, he must be smart. And he's talking British. You know? So kind of the opposite. All right, so Becca. But weird, I'm sorry, this picture's out of focus. I apologize, I don't take pictures of kids in my clinic. I don't have kids in my clinic, so this is a copy of the picture. What do we see in here? Um, <clears throat> the pupillary reflex looks abnormal. Yeah, so you've got a little chorea again on my pupil. I'll give you it right here. This is kind of crystalline lens here, and it's pretty clear. And then over here, you've got all this stuff either behind the lens or even starting to go into the lens. This is clear and this is behind it or starting to go in. Here's the last hint. What are these right here? Those transillumination defects? I can't really so. Here's the pupil right here. Oh, are those zonules? Those are zonules, exactly. So this mass is growing behind the lens, maybe even going into the lens, and it's pulling the material toward the center, so it's stretching those zonules. You can actually see zonules here. You can even see some blood vessels here, and then this part of the lens is clear. So what leads you to give you a picture like this? I don't know. So this is what we used to call PHPV. Persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. Now they call it persistent fetal vasculature. It's the same thing. And so this is it from behind, and it's showing these pulling in of the ciliary processes and pulling in of those zonular bundles with this lesion. Now, what is thought to be the cause of this lesion? So, PHPV, unilateral or bilateral? Bilateral. Actually, mostly unilateral, which is weird. You would say, wait a minute, both eyes are forming at the same time. Why would it involve just one and not the other? Again, I don't know that, but it's actually mostly unilateral. There's a little bit lower power as we back off, and that stock actually goes all the way to the optic nerve, which is where that hyaluronic artery. And here you can see this mass. It can sometimes get 
almost fibrotic, it has lots of blood vessels in it, and then it'll shrink down. And so this is the crystalline lens, believe it or not. This is that hyaluronic artery coming into it, a bunch of little arteries behind it, and then some connective tissue actually invading the crystalline lens. This is what's left of the lens material up here. Dr. Mammoth, huh? two pictures back when you showed it. Could, that, could toxic care also look like that? Uh, it, it could, but you usually don't have a stop going back to the optic nerve in toxic care. So you get a mass behind here, although it's usually maybe open more, over, more over here, but you don't have that stock of that remnant hyaluronic artery, so that's what, what you don't see. You get a retinal detachment from Toxocara, but you can see the retina is still back here, so this is actually a vessel retina. And here we have some, some pathology, and you can see that here's the growth into the crystalline lens, and it's pulling the ciliary processes over. Look at that, the ciliary processes. Here's the aura serrata, and the aura serrata is behind the actual um, iris, and so it's really pulled everything in as it's shrinking. This is a big exudative detachment. And here you can see it pulling it in again. Here's the iris. Here's the aura. These are these ciliary processes being pulled over, so it really suck them over. And so this is a PHPV kind of pulling into the center and, and causing these problems. These are kind of tough to treat sometimes because even if you remove that lens itself and you get rid of all the stuff that's in there, you still have a retina that just doesn't want to detach properly. So these are, you can do heroic measures and these kids still don't do well. Tara, what do we see in here? Um, almost like a bird with papilla. Well, yeah, Bergmeister's papilla go along with it. Now the Bergmeister's papilla is the connective tissue associated with this. And this is, uh, it's called a corkscrew vessel, but this is the posterior part of the hyaluronic artery system that hasn't completely regressed. So this isn't quite PHPV, this is just normally the hyaluronic artery regresses, and at this point it didn't completely regress, so you're left with this little corkscrew vessel. And the Bergmeister's papillae is the connective tissue around it. So here you can see part of the hyaluronic artery that is still present coming off there. And then this is what it looks like. So you see that remnant hyaluronic artery coming up off the nerve. Believe it or not, these people see fine. Um, this usually doesn't affect the vision. And this is just kind of the um, the most mild form of a non-regression of the hyaluronic artery system, where PHPV is the most severe form. There's a lot of things here. They, they, well, not really. They usually don't. It's very uncommon. All right, Chris. What do we see in right here? So you see kind of a white reflex there in the left eye. Um, I don't see any associated with that. Yeah, it's actually bilateral. Yeah, it's bilateral. Um, so, I mean, I guess I don't see any other kind of thing that suggests something other than uh, a cataract or okay. bilateral cataracts. So when you see a bilateral white pupil, first thing you got to think of is a bilateral congenital cataract. And it's important that you recognize that right away because Congenital cataracts are, are like an emergency because kids can get amniopia. A bilateral less bad than unilateral. If you have a unilateral congenital cataract, they can get severe lifelong amniopia, so you've got to get that out of there right away. This could be a bilateral cataract. And we look inside, and let's say this isn't quite that kid, but same disease entity. We look in and we see this. So there's dragging of the, the vessels. So you see the vessels are pulled temporally here. So what entity gives you that? ROP. Exactly. So retinopathy of prematurity, now in its severe phase, before we knew what this entity was, retinopathy of prematurity can give you bilateral white pupils because you get a retinal detachment that pulls up behind the crystalline lens and can look like this. This is the phase that we'll often see either when they've been treated or when it's regressed. You can see years later this drag <coughs> disappearance in, in retinopathy of prematurity. Now this is the end stage of retinopathy of prematurity, and this is that entity that they used to call this condition of retrolental fibroplasia. And it's not really fibroplasia, it's a, it's a total RD, and so you get a total retinal detachment from neovascularization that can occur. So remember what happens to trigger these is these kids actually get too much oxygen. And these kids are in the, in the NICU, they need lots of oxygen, you really want to monitor the oxygen closely because if you give them too much, 
it'll actually cause the normal progression of the retina to stop cold, and then you have an area of avascularity, especially temporally, and then you get neovascularization in there. So that's when they do cryotherapy or laser to try to kill that off. And so this is the end stage. You actually get a total retinal detachment. It's got a lot of extra data in it, and you get this closed funnel behind the optic nerve that can almost look like a congenital cataract. You can have a white space there. Again, once it gets to this stage, these are real buggers to treat. And Steve Charles, who's a just a crazy, I, I know him, just a crazy guy. I mean, he's he's the most aggressive retina guy I've ever seen. He does like, you know, points in Tennessee. And he does like 12 vitrectomies in a day. I mean, he's just insane. And, and he's just a wonderfully gifted surgeon. And even he can't make these kids see better. So these are really tough once they get to this point. So this is a situation where you want to prevent it from getting to this point. This is what it looks like pathologically. Okay, Chris, bonus points. What kind of surgery has this kid had? Uh, and well, he's had like a scleral buckle, but are you exactly. talking about Exactly, so he's had a scleral buckle. How can you tell that? Well, so the, there's remnants of it. Yeah, so this is where the scleral buckle was, right here. And so they tried to do a scleral buckle to save the sign. You see again, a funnel-shaped retinal detachment and previous scleral buckle in this kid. Julia, who is seeing in here? So, this is a specimen of the whole eye, and it looks like a white mass, essentially, and it with uh, some RD. Yeah, white mass with some RD. With an RD. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Could be lots of things, and then we do the path, and the heck is that? That's Exactly, that's a toxocaris cyst. And so, how do these kids get toxocariasis in the eye? Uh, it's from a uh, dog stool. Exactly, so, so what do kids do? You know, puppies, what do puppies do? Puppies eat their stools. And then, what do kids do? They play with puppies, and puppies lick their faces, and they get this stuff that goes into their GI system, then goes through the GI wall, and then can be disseminated throughout the body. And one of the end organs where these toxocariasis cysts can go is the eye. And so again, these are very difficult to treat because if the parasite keeps growing in there, it can cause damage to the eye. But if you try to kill the parasite, then that dead parasite releases all kinds of bad humors into the eye, and that can make the eye have a lot of inflammation in it. So fortunately, very rare. The toxocariasis is always on boards as a potential cause for leukocoria. All right, Ashley, what the heck am I showing here? First of all, where in the eye am I? So you're the ciliary body. Exactly, there's the iris, cornea, ciliary body. And uh, so there's a, a large nest of cells. like weird stuff that's not usually in the eye. Yeah. I'll give you a hint, it's kind of hard, this stuff. Oh, is this uh, cartilage? Yeah, it's cartilage in the ciliary body. Very weird. What can cause cartilage to form in the ciliary body? Dictyoma? It can. Uh, Medropathelioma or dictyoma, what's another one that can cause that? Been named today. Very obscure one. Uh, I don't know. Trisomy 13 can cause this. And again, this is one of those stupid things you have to memorize from boards. Trisomy 13 can cause this. And you can get retinal dysplasia, which gives you a white pupil, but you get you get this cartilage in the ciliary body. And here's the retinal dysplasia. Remember, I said it doesn't necessarily mean a tumor, but when retina is abnormally forming, it forms rosettes. So you can get some funny abnormal retina in these kids, and you get these rosettes starting to form in there. They can give you a white pupil. But this is one of the two entities that can give you cartilage in the ciliary body. As you said, the other one was medioepithelioma or dictyoma. Oh, boy, I love this. I didn't even plant that. What does dictyoma mean? I don't know. From the Greek, net-like. So 
or net like into your life. See, everything comes from the grave. Okay, so we've beaten to death the the idea of leukocoria, but realize that you need to rule out retinoblastoma, but then all these other things can cause it. They love putting this stuff on boards. So when you're going to study for OCAPs, you know, know all of your potential sources for white pupils and kids. Now we're going to shift to adults. Reese, what are we seeing here? It's a pigmented mass on the iris. Apparently, pulling some of Okay, so exactly. It's pulling the iris over. And so when you see pigmented lesions like this, you want to say, okay, are they elevated? Are they irregular? Other things you look for is you look for pulling of the iris border over there. Sometimes you'll even get the posterior iris pigmented feeling pulled around the corner. What do we call that condition? Ectropia and uvian. So these would be suspicious signs. Now, this looks even more suspicious. What are we seeing here? So you look at the slit beam. Here's the slit beam on the iris, I mean on the cornea. Here's the slit beam on the iris. Look at it coming up. It's almost touching. So this is a very, very thick mass. What would your differential diagnosis here be? Exactly. So people would say, well, maybe it could be a nevus. No, nah, probably not. It could be an iris melanoma. So when iris melanomas, when I was being caught in residency, you know, iris melanomas were really benign. In fact, they're 90% you know, curable and people don't die from metastases and the reason for that is because what we were calling iris melanomas in the past were mostly nevi. Because you know, you could see them and you remove them early. So Fred Jacobiak went through all of the iris melanomas at the AFIP and he found like 185 of these and they looked at them all. When they looked at the cellular characteristics they found that two-thirds of them were actually nevi. And so they recalcified, they reclassified iris melanotic lesions. And so there's a classification that you really do have to memorize, again, from benign to more malignant. So, Reese, the very first one, if we're looking at this is an iris lesion pigmented and we see this, what do we call this? Is it spindle? This is a spindle. Well, we don't do A's and B's so much in the iris as we do in the rest of the choroid, but this is a spindle nevus. So they used to call these melanomas. This really isn't a melanoma, it's a spindle nevus. This is the equivalent of a spindle A cell, which technically we call we call a nevus even in the chorus. So look at these spindly shaped nucleus, indistinct cytoplasm, no cellular border, spindle A nevus. Aline, quit cheating. All right, so. I was thinking that part was about that. Ha! So we've got now, this is a piece of iris. What's different about this one? And where are these cells right here? Here's the iris itself. They're on the surface. On the surface. And so some people would call this a plaque. So you have spindle nevus, plus malign nevus, then you can get spindle nevus with plaque. These look a little bit more alarming because these start to grow more. And so people get excited and you do a big peripheral iridectomy on these. Okay, we've gone beyond spindle nevus. What do we see in here, Chris? Uh, so is this now, uh, I guess I'll say spindle B, but I don't know what it's called. Yeah, kind of the equivalent of a spindle B in the cord. You see, now they're getting more oval, more cigar shaped, not that perfect spindly one that we see here. So this is now called a <coughs> borderline <coughs> spindle nevus. So we got spindle nevus, spindle nevus with plaque, borderline spindle nevus. <coughs> Excuse me. Jamie, this one would be a melanoma. Exactly. So we can go to a spindle melanoma. So this is a true spindle B melanoma. Cigar shaped oval cells, single nucleus in them, indistinct cytoplasm, no cellular borders between. So this is a true spindle B spindle melanoma of the iris. All right, what are we seeing right here, Lee? The rarest of these lesions. It escapes me, I don't know. So this is actually an epithelioid cell nevus. Okay. I've seen one of these in my career. Again, you can get nevi 
It almost looked like epithelial cells. Epithelial cell means very, very rare. And then you can get less frequently than this is an epithelioid melanoma, just like melanoma is in the core. So you can get an epithelial cell nevus, epithelial cell melanoma. These are just like the melanomas of the choroid. These are the worst type, epithelial melanomas. Okay, and then there's a couple of other obscure ones that are, that are on that list. But now this is something different. Becca, what's going on here? So <coughs> now we have uh, something dark structure growing in the inferior portion of the iris for temporal. There's another subtle finding on here, so you can see. There's also through the pupil you could see some. I don't know how to describe that. This right here, there's yeah. a lesion right here. It kind of looks like it goes behind the iris and maybe if you were to have x-ray eyes or a B scan, you could actually see through that and see those are all connected. Could so where does that lesion arise from? Ciliary body. Yeah. So this is a ciliary body melanoma. So I actually took this picture myself. So this guy was when I was in residency. He's a University of Illinois alum, goes to all their football games. First game of the season, could see the scoreboard from his seats. Third game, started being fuzzy, and by the last game of the season, he had trouble seeing the scoreboard from his seats. And the reason is, is this tumor was growing here and was pushing on the lens and causing a cataract. And so he came in, his complaint was blurred vision. It's weird. He didn't even notice that, which I find interesting. But, um, well, I mean, guys, guys don't notice anything until the eye falls out of him. <laughs> his wife was with him. You'd think at least, you know, women look for stuff like that. You'd think that she would at least notice it. But he didn't even notice it, but he had a cataract, so he couldn't see the scoreboard. And so this is a ciliary body melanoma. Now, ciliary body and choroid, we all link together. And so they're a separate group from the iris melanomas. And here's another one. Here's that tumor poking out right there, and then here it is poking up here. And sure enough, here is a cataract starting to form next to it as it pushes that crystal So in that there. first picture, that uh, what we were seeing in the lens with that was a cataract. That was a cataract, exactly. Well the tumor was pushing against part of it. But that this is the tumor here. This is a cataract. That little haziness there. And, and here's a nice gonio view. That tumor is sitting in the ciliary body here and then it's pushing up into the angle. And so ciliary body melanoma with extension. Now what are we seeing here, Tara? Um, it kind of looks like there is either a cataract or something in the pupil kind of interiorly in the picture. Okay. And then kind of a, in that same kind of line, there's that really large fetal feeder vessel. And what do we call that? Uh, it's called a sentinel vessel. And the reason that that's important is it will point you right to the tumor. So when you see a dilated vessel like this, and it's isolated, and the rest of the area around the limbus and the conjunctiva and episclera are not dilated, this is a sentinel vessel, and this points you right to the tumor. Yes? I feel like so, I sometimes see people with, um, like, nasally, you know, where, they, where one would develop a trigeum, or people with develop a... Yeah, you can see early changes where you'll actually get more vascularity than you get um, solar-induced degenerative changes, and so you can see that too in chronic irritation. So don't overcall these, but if you see that the eye's totally quiet, there's this one area where there's a vessel, be really leery about something lurking behind it. So it comes <coughs> to that area, it's called a sentinel vessel. And sure enough, here's a tumor arising from the ciliary body, pushing against the crystalline lens, going back almost to the equator. And in this particular case, it's going from posterior to anterior, so it's secondarily invading the anterior chamber angle. So you can get a secondary open angle glaucoma in these, in these patients with this ciliary body melanoma. Now, the reason we worry about a ciliary body melanoma, there's two reasons. These have relatively poorer prognosis compared to choroidal melanomas. One theory is that they sit behind the iris, so they can grow a long time, and you don't notice symptoms. So these could be growing for a while and people don't notice it. But the second thing is 
you remember you've got all these aqueous veins over here and they drain blood uh, and they drain aqueous and then uh, eventually drain out. And so this is an area where there's a lot of potential places for these tumor cells to go. So if you look at this, here's a ciliary body melanoma, but look up here at low power, there's some blue cells up there. So that raises suspicion. And then we look at a close up and sure enough, here's one of the aqueous veins. Here's a vein on the episclera. There's tumor cells already getting out of the eye. And so the cellular body melanomas can gain access to get out of the eye quicker too. So they're a little bit worse than choroidal. So for medullal epitheliomas, do they look different than what you see there? For yeah, I, can't, I don't remember if I had enough time to put one in here with this lecture that's short, but they do look different. You can get some stretch processes that they can go almost looking like a you know, kid that's got PHPV. And, but sometimes they can be confused for, for uh, melanomas. And one of the important things to tell them apart is you do an ultrasound. Roger Harry's got that 50 hertz probe, which is really good. And when you look at medullary epitheliomas, they've got cords of cells trying to make ciliary body. And then in between them, you've got tissue. So you get a lot of high and low spikes. Whereas the melanoma is very solid. And so when Roger does the ultrasound, the A scan, you get really low reflectivity inside them. So that's the way you tell them apart. All right, we're sitting here. Chris, what are we seeing here? Uh, it looks like a coil venous. So versus melanoma. Again, it's really good that, that the lecture was last Wednesday. They were talking about Jerry Shields and Carol Shields' mnemonic that you do to tell you if something is worrisome, if it's a coroidal lesion. And what was their mnemonic? to look for, oh, I think about this. I was just thinking about this walking in. So it's, um, it's too small. Actually, it was, I think it's too fine. Oh, small. Oh, yeah, too fine, small. Um, the last two parts of it. Oh, yeah, ocular melanomas, that's right. All right, so remember that mnemonic because that tells you the things to look for to make you suspicious for something that's a nevus, that's a melanoma as opposed to a simple nevus. So it's a nice way of looking at them. They talk about like fusin on there, they talk about fluid, they talk about location and how big it is. And so if you remember that mnemonic, it really helps you to say, could this be benign or malignant? This looks pretty benign. It's not elevated, there's no fluid, there's no like fusin on there. Now this, on the other hand, would you be more suspicious of this? So you can see now, this is uh, focusing on the surface of this growth, and that's why the optic nerve is out of focus, because there's a tumor underneath the retina pushing it forward. And so this is really suspicious for a tumor in the coral. Now if you look right here, this was something that at one time was called a nevus, so this isn't quite as easy to tell, but look at these little orange areas here. That's lipofusin. And it is elevated, there's even a little bit of fluid around it. And so this was something that was followed as a nevus that then started to show suspicious findings for, for a possible melanoma. Dr. Mavis, huh? so they say that if it has drusen on it, it's supposed to be considered uh, benign. Right, drusen is a good thing. But then when you see those But lipofusin orange, yeah. looks orange as opposed to the little yellow drusen. So see these orange areas here? So that's... So that's, that's actually a, a, a bad sign, where little tiny drusen are a good sign. Now here's the classic growth pattern. Julia, what pattern are we showing here? So you see the mushroom shape, which is really commonly seen in these choroidal melanomas. Why do you get a mushroom shape? Because the uh, tumor grows through and breaks through Bruch's membrane, and that's where it kind of pinches off that stalk, and then the rest of it grows. Through. Yeah, so remember, Brooks' membrane was that five-layered sandwich, and the innermost layer was an elastic layer, so it almost acts as a tether. So the tumor cells break through, but Brooks still is kind of elastic, so it almost acts like a ring there. And then the tumor cells break through, and then they start mushrooming out, growing. So here's where Brooks' membrane would be, here to here, and then that tumor broke through, and then it spreads out underneath the retina when it's growing. And so thus the mushroom shape that you can see. Now sometimes there'll just be a small tumor growing here. Now because this is on the posterior pole, this is recognized early. And so you see that early. Now, cell types, one more time. What do we have here, Julia? Spindle A. Spindle A. So we would call this almost a nevus, but same thing. Spindly nuclei, no nucleoli, indistinct cytoplasm, no clean cellular borders. 
Oh, Ashley, you want to call this? The top looks like they're more spindle B and the bottom looks more All right, so we look at close up. So spindle B, how do you tell those? So they're slightly more oblong, not quite as slick sharp edge, and then you start to see nucleoli. Yeah, so you see kind of a cigar shaped cell, nucleoli in them. Still kind of an interesting cytoplasm. The cell borders are all run together. Reese, what are these? Uh, those are more epithelioid. Epithelioid. So you see that they're, they're bigger. <coughs> Lots of disruption of the site of the uh, nucleus. You see chromatin. You can see multiple nuclei, but you see cellular borders now. Very big cell. They even get multinucleated cells, and so. Epithelioid, and that's important because that's the main prognostic factor of these tumors. Is that spindle E tumor, spindle B pure, have the best prognosis? A mixture of the two, mixed spindle epithelioid, have a moderate prognosis. Pure epithelioid, which are uncommon, have a worse prognosis. So they're the most aggressive. And this is what you call kind of a mix. There's a few little spindle cells in here, not many, and a lot of epithelioid cells. So these can be. Okay, Eileen, what are we showing here? Um, there's a dark area on the surface of the skin, the outside surface of the skin. What is this thing that, that the forcep is holding up? Could be a blood vessel. Yeah, could be a blood vessel. So how do these tumors get out of the eye? Um, the blood vessels. Yeah, so they go through the channels, and we call them emissarial channels. You know, emissary is something that goes through the front line to the other side. So emissary, you're going to talk peace with the other guys, you wave your white flag, you go through the line. And so <coughs> this is an emissarial channel. So these tumors, they can't just eat through sclera. Sclera is really tough. And so anywhere where the sclera has a weak point, like a vein draining it, an artery coming in, a nerve coming in, that is where the tumors go. So this is a vortex vein draining the choroid. And now here you can see a tumor growing. It doesn't necessarily have to go inside the vein, but it goes along that channel where the vein has come. And then eventually you can even get um, outside the eye. It goes through the sclera and eventually on the surface. So we look very carefully at these um, globes that are removed with tumors in them to make sure that they have metastasized. And where do they metastasize to? Uh, to the, liver. the liver. And what's our saying, how we remember where they go? Beware the yellow man with the glass eye. <laughs> Think about it. All right? So when you're on oral boards, you always sit there going, yellow oh, man, something about an eye. So because these metastasize to the liver, uh, most commonly. All right. Um, Chris, 70-year-old woman, vague eye complaints. Um, kind of a creamy or white, irregular-looking lesion under the retina. All right, so it's definitely not melanotic. Sometimes they're unilateral, sometimes they're bilateral. So if we're looking at tumors to the choroid, some people say number one is melanoma. <coughs> Others would say no. The most common tumor of the choroid is not a melanoma. It is a metastatic tumor. And so metastatic lesions can go to the choroid. And if you took autopsies, you would probably find more of these than you think, because when people get widespread tumors, they'll often go to the choroid. So in women, the most common tumor that you see is breast carcinoma. So you see these white, they can even be multilobulated, lesions, irregular borders, even bilateral. And sure enough, when we do this, it's an adenocarcinoma. And so this is a breast adenocarcinoma. Now, if you really look at them now, adenocarcinoma used to be here, lung carcinoma used to be here in women now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. And so when they used to allow cigarette advertising on TV, there's this really sleek, sophisticated woman. And she smoked these really cool looking cigarettes. And the catch line was, you've come a long way, baby. That was it. <laughs> okay, the advertising in the 60s, huh? And so the idea was that women are sleek and sophisticated too. And, and it's true. Women now smoke like men, and so they can die just like men do from lung cancer. So lung cancer metastases are going up and up and up in terms of women now, because women are now smoking like men. Fortunately, population-based smoking in the last 30 years has really gone down from like 
half the population to fourth, but still a fourth of the population smoke. So lung tumors are commonly seen. This is a metastatic lung, which is the most common in men. And here you can see this is a lung carcinoma, metastatic to the core. You can sometimes even get prostate tumors, you can get GI tumors. Okay, and we say goodbye to the Tetons. So um, when we do our review for OCAPs, we're just going to flash slides as quick as we can. You guys are going to say pattern recognition. That's this, that's this, that's this. Questions? 